So I had a question for Sarah, which is, um, it's a technical question, but I think it probably has um, some bearing on the outcomes, the social and behavioral outcomes of baby seek, probably too, and that is, how did you guys decide what conditions to put on the sequencing panel? Because I, I guess that's such a controversial issue generally, and depending on what results people are gonna get back for what conditions, that will probably affect just everything downstream, right? It was, was that controversial at all? Yeah, it definitely was, and given the research group that I'm working with, there, there were advocates of including everything, um, <laughs> but we ultimately decided to include um, pathogenic variants associated with childhood onset conditions because there's potential for more imminent um, manifestations and use of that information, and because parent, not only for the infant, um, him or herself, but for the parents who may still be making reproductive decisions. And right. could. Um, those results could more directly impact their reproductive decisions. So um, we have um, one PH uh, postdoc who has been curating the literature for months and months and, um, and the existing databases and um, identifying, starting with a medical exome, um, start going through all of the, um, the genes and identifying those that have solid evidence for childhood onset and strong associations with disease. Right. Um, so that's, it, it, it was a process, but that's yeah. how we settled. Cool. So just to respond to what you were saying, Lori, um, and Danielle can jump in whenever. I think that, um, uh, so uh, the cl I think in terms of collaboration, what I found most helpful is looking really close to home. So I haven't collaborated with lots of big outside groups, but obviously, you know, Danielle and I collaborated because we, we knew we were familiar with each other's research training from, you know, being in the, in the program together. And I think we've also had some really fruitful um, collaborations, as Layla knows, um, with the students involved in the, in the program as well. So I think that that's been really fruitful for us. Yeah, and I would say I'm going to go to the practical side of things, mm -hmm. that my day job has nothing to do with exome sequencing. So I work in industry, I have a very different job, so the hat that I get to wear doing this collaboration serves the purpose of keeping my fire lit about what matters in genetics. So um, I think that the way that I can do this is that Julie has a 100% research job, I have a 100% not research job, and we can find the middle mm -hmm. where I can find pieces of this to be a part of the team. So that is very, like from a logistical standpoint, that's important. Although one of the things you guys haven't talked about is why you needed a collaborator, which I think is a central issue to, to, to Lori's question. Yeah, absolutely, I think that um, we, it was it would be entirely too close to home for me to conduct the interviews because I interact with our participants in every other way. So I'm trying to divorce myself from that process intentionally. And then, you know, coding the 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 transcripts was another area that we introduced. A, 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 we're we're having you know research assistants and summer students do that as well. Also, just because um, there's so there's so much that I could that I could. Um, impose upon um, participants' responses just because I interact with them in so many different ways, yeah. While my mic is on, though, I had a question for you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sarah. I think that, um, you know, the project is super interesting. I am curious if there is um, a mechanism. Uh, t I, I feel like there's as much to be learned about the decliners um, as from people who, who choose to participate. and. Um, uh, I'm curious if there's been any discussion of, of trying to ascertain you know, some reasons for declining at all. And, and also then I guess the practical question that I'm just curious about is what's the blood volume here? <laughs> and how is it obtained? Especially from the healthy newborns, I think that's so yeah. interesting. And also, are you doing consent? <laughs> I was so curious, yeah, it's right yeah. after they've given birth and how long is that process? Because yeah. your consent is pretty long, right? Yeah. Okay, remind me if I miss some of these questions, but um, <laughs> um, so decliners. So we plan to ask for basic demographics um, and a reason for declining. We haven't yet come up with, are we going to provide them with some structured reasons and then give them some a f option for a free text, but we will try to gather those reasons. Um, what was your second question, Julie? Blood volume. Oh, blood I'm volume. I'm so interested in that. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna, for the NICU babies, we're gonna try to time it with a clinical stick. But there are, I, and I'm forgetting exact volumes, so unfortunately I won't be able to give you that. But I know there are regulations in how much blood can be drawn within a certain time period, and that could get um, 
we may um, have to really think carefully about that because for the NICU babies over the course of their NICU stay, it could exceed that if, you know, on the, in, with the addition of our research draw. Um, so uh, there have been, this is a, a bit tangential, but we, there have been discussions about how closely should this model newborn screening and should we try to um, gather on um, the Guthrie card you know, and, and then, but I think what we've ultimately, I think we're at a decision um, at this point is that that's not really the intent or the goal of our study is to, it's not to model newborn screening, but it's to look at the use of this information. So we're probably, we're probably talking at capillary too, but I don't know exact volume. Yeah, I, w I would think that's possible. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Tricia, what was your other oh, question? Okay. My other question was just about the consent, how you envision, how much time, when, I just think practically speaking, newborn, yeah. you know, postpartum period is, people barely remember they had newborn screen, you know, yeah. let alone genome sequencing. So. Yeah, and that's part of why we did the pilot survey in that period, but again, that was so different than actually offering parents to, uh, participation in the study. Um, so we're, our, our goal is to do consent in the hospital before, before moms are just moms and babies are discharged um, but we'll do it any time up until 30 days of life it's easier um, easier of course if they're in the hospital and they're the captive audience but we also don't want to put time pressure on parents when that's obviously not the ideal time for some to be making a decision like this so but we would ask them to come back for at, at least for the blood draw but um We'd ask them to come back, and that adds that, that logistic difficulty. Um, and um, how long is it? Oh, 60, 60 to ninety minutes. Sixty. To Sixty. 90 prob minutes. If you if you consider the pre-enrollment counseling piece, which I really think is more just consent, it's just a thorough consent. So that's probably in itself like an hour, and then the actual um, formal consent, signing the paperwork, blood draw and family history, I would say that would add another half hour. Wow. Yeah. You anticipated getting decliners for that? <laughs> or people who opt out halfway through? I mean, it's you know, pretty I need onerous. To sleep, I need to breastfeed, I need to. <laughs> I, the whole Can you tell Trisha just had a baby? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the study as a whole, it, it is it's quite onerous for them to come back for the results, come back again a year later for the exam. Yep. I had a question too for I think it was Katie. Katie, um, for your side, do you or anybody do you know if anyone's ever looked at? I find it so interesting, you know what people are more surprised about with their genetic test results, and I'm not surprised, well, somewhat that they're more nervous about the things that are already in their family. I'm just thinking of people in my own counseling, the direct consumer, people who have a history of Alzheimer's, that's the one that they freak out about, right? You could tell them they would be our same mutation, they would, whatever, it's not in my family, I don't care. Um, has anyone asked, or are you guys asking, if people can opt out of things that are in their family? Like, present it that way, you know, a, you know, you can opt out of Parkinson's results, or you can opt out of heart disease. Um, I don't know about anybody asking about it in that way. I think it's an interesting way to think about it, but I think you're exactly right that when you break it up into categories of like preventable or unpreventable, the examples that are going to come to their mind and that they're pulling out for you do tend to be these things that either are in their families or that they have some sort of experience with in the community um, through friends or things like that. Um, but I don't think anybody that I know of is asking about that as a sp specific sort of type of result or a way of categorizing. So it's a good thought. What about the one, you'll know about this and I don't, the one result where the woman's family history was so burning to her they made a special exception and looked for the mutation. So it's the opposite of what you're saying. It was actually turned out to be um, essential to her motivation to participating in ClinSeq to begin with. Yeah, so we, we have people all the time who actually are calling about this um, and really want this. I actually just, um, it's too bad Nina's not here. Nina's one of the counseling students and she just consented somebody on Friday and that was exactly what she wanted was, will you take my family history and then adjust my risk profile for the things that are specifically in my family history based on what you see genetically? And I, I think it was so instructive for us because I didn't, I don't think about it that way. I think about a genome first approach, but so many people look at this as a way of modifying existing risk. Um, 
And so it, it really does make sense. And a lot of people, that is absolutely what they're after. So it may be a really helpful way to talk about risk um, in the consent process and I think when we're returning results, yeah. Well, and Trisha, probably the people who don't want to know about the thing in their family aren't going to enroll in this. Or tell you about it, right? So, which again gets back to the thing I had asked Katie about, but which is like, to what extent should we even be thinking about this as predictive genetic testing for something that's in your family? Because it's totally different from that. So, I had a question um, for you guys and for Sarah as well. Just thinking about the fact that um, the most impactful results are rare events. Uh, and you have a great sample size, but it's still a rare event, um, particularly for the, the healthy cohort. Uh, how we go about getting that data um, and really understanding what that's like for people. Um, question slash comment slash concern slash challenge. Clinseek, I think is, is, I mean, our, yeah, that's never, it's, the, our our sample size is really too small, and it, it, but it's a it's a really great consideration, and you know we talk about this all the time that for many people this is really, it's not a big deal until it is, right? And so it's like one in a thousand people for whom it's going to be a big deal. But it's a lot of people you have to. It's, it's just it, it's just interesting. I think yeah, it's a big consideration. Partly out of concern that we would have boring results, we would have nothing to say to people. That's, that's part of the reason why we decided to include carrier status and to include a limited number of pharmacogenomic variants. So these aren't necessarily, they're not as impactful, um, but it, at least it's some, something to talk about, something to study. One of the things that I was taking note of um, it seems like a lot of this is cutting edge research based on rolling out new technologies. But in our sample today, and I know there's lots of other examples of things we're doing that weren't um, discussed today, um, we didn't talk much about effectiveness of genetic counseling, a little bit with Jillian's engagement um, protocol, but effectiveness of genetic counseling in meeting client needs. And I wonder what thoughts you had as you were listening to these talks about um, opportunities to pursue uh, related questions. I think it's such, I don't have an answer, but I think it's such an important question and I think it's something that we should, it's so many of us now are getting engaged in these sorts of studies that are being funded because they have the question about the genetic testing itself. And is there an opportunity for us to really push you know, what part, what, what's the role of genetic counseling in the study and are there embedded questions that we can include that either qualitatively allow us to look at the process, those are probably the easiest to put in, you know, to look at the process of what the counseling is like and what the patients take from it, but also are there things that we could do even further than that, that can we embed a separate ran nested randomized trial within the randomized trial to look at different interventions. I think the extent to which we can take advantage of these opportunities and do that would be great. It would help um, Jillian's quest for evidence-based practice and the practice guidelines. I think that's really where we need to be going and we're not going to get those kinds of studies funded on their own right as easily as these other, the larger studies are getting funded. So, so I really like the part of, um, if I'm getting this right. I really like the part of Gillian's talk where she said that the ultimate outcome is better health outcomes for patients. So a lot of the things that get measured when we talk about genetic counseling, efficacy, and evidence-based are proxies for the ultimate goal, which is people not dying from cancer, people having better, and, and better health outcomes has a component of psychosocial health as well as not getting sick. but. That seems to me like we, we get all caught up in these proxies for what the real goal is and, and we lose sight of what we're really trying to accomplish. So I mean, I, I tend to now think more in terms about when I think about what I'm trying to accomplish in our reporting and things like that, that actually I'm not so much focused on the proxies like people being, you know, understanding people, I mean, the, to the extent that understanding your results leads to a better health outcome, that's great. But actually, 
if you really had to weigh things, it's actually better that they not get cancer than that they understand autosomal dominant inheritance. And so I, I really very much like the idea of focusing on health outcomes. Katie won't brag, so I'll talk about her um, from the other end of the table. She's spending all of her time now implementing an exquisitely complicated randomized control trial um, that gets at um, what we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, which is taking advantage of return of carrier results to ClinSeq participants, where um, Katie's being compared to a web-based platform um, and in terms of returning results, looking at similar outcomes. And um, each of those two cells is randomized to half of them receive genetic counseling and half of them not. So it also looks at the additional question of potential added benefit or not of genetic counseling following the genetics education. So she's very tightly sticking to an education model um, for the first part that parallels the information that's in the web-based platform. Um, and then doing more counseling as a separate um, endeavor is very hard to do because you have to resist all your clinical instincts to do counseling at the same time you do education, so it isn't necessarily pleasant. Um, but I think it's a really cool opportunity to tease apart where we need services. And somebody, when I presented the original design in our SBRB um, works in progress, um, somebody said, you know, you could put your profession to shame, and you could put him out of business by doing this study. So I thought was a peculiar, it, he was being provocative. Um, but the truth is, I don't care. I mean, if we find out that people learn information about carrier status in a way that's effective and useful to them, and they have a good idea what they want to do with it, just as well as with Katie. Katie is a lot more expensive than a web-based platform. And it would be really nice to have one at home on your computer that you could have charge of and, and manage. Why would we not want to preserve our time and effort to people who really need it? So I think um, there is some practical value in just, especially as things roll out into mainstream medicine, starting to ask. It's a fairly boring practical research question, but um, I think it has some real um, impl implications for going forward and helping us from a research perspective carve out where are the patients that really need this. Uh, you know, a lot of them aren't paying, you know, in preliminary data, aren't paying a lot of attention to things that were unexpected, they're not landing on them too much, they're not too worried about them, so there's not a lot of counseling needs there. Um, there, there may not be a lot of counseling needs around carrier status. Obviously, we haven't gotten any data to analyze yet. Um, so where are the points at which genetic counselors need to be involved? And as this rolls out, it's pretty important for us to identify places where client, important client needs are being met. And I agree mostly with Eric. Um, I still think that there are a couple of proxy outcomes for which there's evidence they're linked to behaviors that are pretty important, and those psychological well-being outcomes, I think, are important um, to capture as part of um, well-being overall, health, good health. Um, but again, everybody knows forever, I didn't care if people understood all the details, because that's not necessarily related to what they do with the information and whether or not they're better off for it in the long run. So I think we have to pay a lot of attention to the the, the implications and practical value of the things that we're studying. Not everything we do needs to be about saving genetic counseling in the future, um, and I think it primarily has to be hitched to what clients' needs are and whether they're being met, but I think a good portion of our effort should be focused in that direction to think a little bit more about um, as Lori introduced, adding this on to other things we're doing where we can look at um, potential implications for the role of genetic counselors. So I have a question for anybody who's involved in industry and being somebody who's in industry. So there's all this really fascinating research going on, but is industry playing a role in any of this? And um, do you see it? And do you find there is a role for some of this? Because you've got 23 and me giving all these exomes I mean are they doing anything if you've got you know mm. where where do you where do you add that in in not academia or does it only happen in academia mm. what we're talking about? Um, 
So I, I don't know if I can give you a very concrete answer, but um, Neha and I are founding members of a group of genetic counselors who are interested in doing research in industry. And our um, first steps were to tackle things like private IRBs and public-private partnerships and just sort of process-related things in order to get these studies set up. Because I think especially as the industry gets bigger and bigger, the need for concerted efforts to tie in um, gets greater. And I think genetic counselors present like a really nice space where you can bring people together to do research so long as it stays in the pre-competitive space, which is a new term I've learned recently. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be interesting too because I work I mean in basically industry although in genetic counseling but um, you know to have more collaborations with other research groups because I think there's a hesitancy to reach out to industry folks like us <laughs> and, but we have a lot of data you know so I think if there's any interest it, you know if you have interested persons um, from the research or academia side you know there's a ton of information probably more information about a population with which academic centers don't have access to you know, low income, rural, um, not usually interested in formal genetic counseling, it'd be really great to compare those populations, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think for me too, um, my company is very actively involved in research and we're constantly coming up with new collaborations that we can do with some of our clients or, you know, genetic counselors working at various MFM offices, prenatal offices where they're interested in doing something, they don't have the funding we have the data, they're using our testing, so let's use that as a way to see, okay, what's patient's experience of expanded care screening? That's not really a question that anyone's really addressed. So, you know, those are like some of the projects, but I think very open and it's really great to work because you don't have to worry about money. <laughs> I think that like bridging the gap in these worlds, I think that that's something that I continually think about, right? Academia, nobody's got time, nobody's got money. Industry, you've got too much money to do something else with, so where you find the middle is where I think could be really fascinating. Is there anybody here who's recently been hired by GeneDX? That's amazing because they've just hired about 75 genetic counselors in this area. That would be a really incredible opportunity with all these genetic counselors that they now have recently hired, many of whom I know are interested in research. Um, they're going to be sitting on a lot of data. They hire genetic counselors for a reason. They're going to start doing a lot of this um, on genome sequencing. That would be an incredible collaboration. I think um, we should break for lunch. Um, a few comments about lunch. There is a lot of vegetarian options. It's uh, Mediterranean food. Um, and there is some chicken on one of the platters, so you'll have to figure out the differences. Um, I paid for it, which I'm happy to do. Um, I think that Chris put out a hat. <laughs> so if you want to contribute a little bit, don't contribute more than $10, but if you want to contribute something, that would be great. You don't have to. And just to remind people as they're planning their days, I know some people have plans this evening, but I am um, hosting a reception at the house afterwards. I need about 20 minutes by myself before you get there, um, but not much time because it's just going to be wine and some finger food. So yeah, you're welcome to get there soon. So I hope you'll plan on coming. Even if you can only stay for a short time, it would be great to have you. Um, and I think over lunch, while I encourage you to sit with people and have a working lunch, we can eat in here. Um, just sit wherever you want and talk about whatever you want. And then we'll reconvene at 1.30. 1.30? No, 12.30. Sorry. <laughs>